So let's continue on with treatment studies and look at interpreting the results. And it might be helpful to use a real example to illustrate some of these calculations we're going to do. So I'm going to go for the big gun here. Let's do this, the IST3 trial published in May 2012. And what this looks at is patients who have a stroke. And so that's obviously a drawing of a brain, and you can see there is the stroke. If we give them a drug called TPA, or recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, within six hours, how do they do? And you could see, they're looking at two things here. We're looking at good stuff, benefits, and bad stuff, harms. So let's look at the findings section, at least in the abstract. So we're starting out with three... 035 patients. And you could see that they came from 156 hospitals in 12 countries. So they came from everywhere. They were split into two groups. They were randomized. That's in the methods section, not in the results section, but they were randomized. So we know that there were 1515 in the TPA group and 1520 in the control group. I'm going to stay consistent with the way that I've been drawing these before by putting the experimental group here at the bottom and the control here at the top. And I put the number of patients in each group here. And, and we know here we're looking at over six months time. And remember we were looking at two outcomes. The first one was that the happy outcome, the good one, was that they were alive and independent. And there were 554 here in the treatment group versus 534 in the control group. Then we're also looking at the unhappy outcome of having a fatal or non-fatal symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage that is bleeding in your brain. Not a good thing. Within seven days. And we can see that it occurred in 104 patients in the, control, in the treatment group and 16 patients in the control group. So for me, when looking at these studies, I like to use that diagram that we've been using so far because it really helps me understand what's going on and put things in the right spot and right perspectives because all this text just kind of confuses me. But we're going to go through all of it. Okay, so let's clean this up a bit. So all I did here was just recopy that information from the previous table over here, taking out all the drawings, just leaving the numbers, but you can still see here this was our initial sample size control group, experimental group, we got everybody to go through the full study. These are met this, the patients who had the good outcome. These are the patients that had the bad outcome. Now, let's start calculating some things. So let's look at the event rate of these things. And the event rate really just means how many people had the outcome over how many people total we're looking at. So here, we really have four event rates we're going to calculate. We're going to calculate the control event rate and the experimental event rate for the two different outcomes. So let's start with the first one. So the control event rate, or CER, would be 534 over 1520. And if you do that math, it comes out to 35%. Now, let's look at the experimental event rate. And so that's going to be 554 over 1515, which is about 37%. Now let's do the same thing for the negative outcomes. So the control uh, event rate for the negative outcome would be 16 over 1520, or about 1%. And the experimental event rate would be 104 over 1515 or about 7%. So I just moved these event rates up here into the table next to their corresponding numbers so we can clean up this bottom space. Now let's look at some absolute parameters. And what that really means is we just want to know how much better or worse is the control group compared to the experimental group. So for the, the green one, this is our happiness thing, our benefit, how much benefit increase did we get from the experimental to the control? And that's easy. It's 37 minus 35, or 2%. And on the flip side, how much worse off was one group compared to the other? 
And usually we're going to say the control group compared to the experimental because we're hoping that it would, uh, the treatment would make it better. And so we're talking about the absolute risk reduction. How much did we reduce the risk from the experimental group to the control group? And it looks like we actually reduced it negative uh, 6%. So I just moved these numbers up to here. And so the absolute benefit increase, 2%, and the absolute risk reduction, 6%, or negative 6%. It really depends on, on how you're looking at these numbers. You could call it negative 6 or 6%. Okay. So those numbers were absolute parameters. Now let's look at some relative parameters. So the first one we'll look at is the relative risk. And that is equal to the experimental event rate over the control event rate. And that's equal to 7 over 1, or 7, or 700 percent. And so what this means is that the relative risk in the control group is 700 percent more than the experimental group. It means you're 700 percent more likely to have this bad thing happen to you in the experimental group than you are in the control group. Now, if this was a study in which the treatment was actually helpful, you might see that this number would be less than 100%, so maybe it would be 50% or 25%, meaning the experimental group had the bad outcome happen only 25% of the time. And a relative benefit can also be calculated in a similar way, and that comes out to 1.06 or 106%, and so that means that the experimental group is 106% more likely, or 1.06 times more likely to have the good outcome, being alive and independent, than the control group is. And finally, let's look at the relative risk reduction, or the relative benefit increase, meaning how much are you going to reduce the risk how much more likely is a treatment going to make it that you are not going to have the bad thing happen to you? Or how much more likely is it going to be that the treatment is going to make the good thing happen to you? And so the formula for this is the, the absolute risk reduction over the control event rate. Or, on this side, the absolute benefit increase over the control rate. So let's plug those numbers in. So for the absolute benefit increase is 2%, and we know the control rate is 35%. 2 over 35 gives you 5.7%. This means it's going to a particular patient who might have this disease, if they were to get the treatment, has a 5.7% uh, chance of, that they'd be more likely to have the benefit happen to them. So it's good. The bigger this number, the better. Let's look at the other side. So similarly, a particular given patient, if they were to get the treatment, uh, what, would, what would happen to their likelihood of having the bad thing happen to them? Well, in this case, unfortunately, it would go up. It would go up 600%. One last thing we'll look at are odds ratios. So let's calculate these. How do you calculate the odds? And so let's first look at this. So this is, again, our, our sample. We have the control group and the experimental group. And this is our benefit here. We have 534 people in the control group experience the benefit, and 554 in the experimental group experience the benefit. So how many did not experience the benefit? So in the control group, that's 986, which is really 1520 minus 534. And in the experimental group, it's 961, which is 1515 minus 554. So this is different than when you're calculating the percentages, because when you were doing that, your denominator were all the people, right? Now your denominator is the people who did not experience the benefit. So it's the number who had the benefit over the number who didn't have the benefit, as opposed to the number who had the benefit versus all people. So let's divide these. 534 divided by 986 comes out to 0.54. And, and in this one, 554 over 961 comes out to 0 0.58. So what does this mean? I'll be honest with you. I've always had a hard time getting my mind wrapped around these odds. I'm not a gambler. 
but you should know how to calculate them, and that's how you calculate them. And the final thing is the odds ratio, which is the odds of the experimental group over the odds of the control group, which comes out to 1.07. So an odds ratio of 1 means that there's really no difference between the two. An odds ratio of greater than 1 means that the experimental group is more likely to experience this benefit, and the odds ratio less than 1 means that they're less likely to experience this benefit. You may see something called an adjusted odds ratio in some papers, and what that means is they're using some fancy statistical tricks to try to control for other factors, uh, like maybe there were more smokers in this group than this group, and so you want to try to use the statistics to even them out. Don't worry about that for now. At least understand the odds ratio. An odds ratio of 1 means there's no difference. Greater than 1 means that they're more likely, and less than 1 means it's less likely. So let's take a minute to go through the various statistics we looked at here. The 1 was the control event rate, which looks at all the people in the control group who have the outcome, versus all the people in the control group. Experimental event rate, all the people in the experimental group with the outcome versus all in the experimental group. The absolute risk reduction is the control event rate minus the experimental event rate. And there is a corresponding uh, one for the absolute benefit increase. Relative risk is the experimental event rate over the control event rate. And the relative risk reduction is the absolute risk reduction over the control event rate which, if you expand out the formulas, you'll find out is the same as control over experimental over control, which is the same as 1 minus experimental over the control, which is the same as the 1 minus the relative risk. And there will be similar formulas for uh, benefit increases as well. Okay, so next we're going to look at how to apply this to your patient. See you in the next video.